Welcome to Live Wild with me, Hilary Rose. This is the podcast that gently encourages you to think outside the box, just like this episode's guest, the one and only Joanne McNally. I think Joanne is one of the very best comedians on the scene right now. Not only that, her podcast, My Therapist Ghosted Me with Vogue Williams, is constantly around number one on the iTunes charts, and that is no mean feat. And if you haven't listened to it yet, it is simply brilliant. We chat about her phenomenal rise to success, being constantly on tour, her vices, trolling, laughing at funerals, plant medicine, and how her therapist actually did ghost her. It's called My Therapist Ghosted Me. Did your therapist ghost you? Yeah. <laughs> During lockdown. <laughs> Unbelievable. I actually, and I was so, I, I re... It, t- Finding a therapist, I I had a, t- I had a tough time during lockdown, as we all did, mm-hmm. right? But I did have a tough time, and um, I found this therapist who I absolutely loved. Now I was seeing him before lockdown, mm. but I got I kind of really went into myself during lockdown. A couple of things happened, and I wasn't in a great headspace, um, and he just disappeared. And I was so <laughs> devastated because he sorry was so for ca- laughing. I'm sorry. No, but it's it's hilarious. Like, who's you fucking care? I didn't even know they could do that. <laughs> I was like, are you not legally obliged to listen to my shit? <laughs> Come on! This chat with Joanne cracked me up. She is just as funny in person as she is on stage, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. You can find out more about her tour dates on her website, joannemcnally.com, or follow her on Instagram at joannemcnallycomedy. And now, here's the show. Joanne McNally on the Live Wild podcast. It is an honor to have you here taking time out from a tour. She's selling out everywhere. Everywhere. She's a sellout. You're a sellout, Joanne. <laughs> I know that's, that's, that's very sinister undertones, doesn't it? <laughs> You're a sellout. You're a snake. Unbelievable. Hi. Hi. Oh my God. Like, congratulations. And thank you so much for taking time out to chat because. Not at all. The dates, I, I'm just seeing it on your Instagram. The dates are going on and on and on and on. Yeah. And I'm like, this is absolutely incredible. You're selling out every single venue all over the place, going back, selling out again. But you have to promise me one thing. Yeah, of course. Don't have a banger. Please don't have a banger. <laughs> What's a banger? A heart attack with the amount of work. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I definitely will. But like, rest assured, there's a banger in the post. <laughs> But you know what it is? I think it. I think it looks more impressive than it is because, I guess, with the with the, the power of podcasts is that you get into the ears of way more people, and I, with the ticket sales the way they are, mm. I could probably, I could do bigger. The pro, especially in Ireland, there's no kind of middle venue, so there's either the Vicar Streets mm. or an arena. Yeah. There isn't, a, there isn't, there's no like 3,000 seater in Ireland. So it, there's only like Vicar Street or like I think the arena is 13,000 or something like that. So, and because I don't want to do an arena really ultimately because I don't feel there's a lot of e- like um, energy in the room or there's not, it's hard to have a rapport with the audience in a room that size. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I keep doing. So, you know, I'm kind of making more work for myself really, but it, I think it's better in the long run. 100%. What was the marquee? Numbers four, wise. 442, 4200. Yeah. I didn't make it, but I heard that that was unbelievable. Brilliant. Like, it was great crack. I, well, I, from my perspective, because I was a little concerned because I hadn't done a room that size mm. with Prosecco. Like, I've done bigger rooms, but like on a lineup for a charity gig, you know, that way, like they weren't my shows. But um, I was one, I was curious as to how it would go. But actually, I had a really good time. <laughs> Good. Once I'm enjoying myself, well, that's, who cares? That's actually like, that is, I, I would say 80% of it. Because the second you stop enjoying it is the second you got to call it quits. And as well, I mean, if you're not enjoying it, they're certainly, they probably, well, they, they probably won't enjoy it either. They'll I, probably sense it off you if you're just rattling through it. Which has happened to couple, there's been a couple of shows in the tour where something happened in my head or whatever, where I did kind of go into autopilot and I can feel it and they can feel it and it's a horrible feeling I remember remember I came to the one in the in the yeah. everyman and I, ca- I came knocking on your door afterwards and I was like bursting into your dressing room going Joanne that was unbelievable and you were like 
I was oh, in the horrors. You were in the horrors. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, I, I was, don't, yeah. I don't get, I, like I could see there was like a reaction to you on stage at one point, like your reaction on stage was just a bit yeah. like, oh fuck. But you like, you just plowed through it straight away. And I was like, no, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. You it know was. I mean? For me though, it's horrible when you're, it's when you're the one, cause you feel like you've let them down. You've let yourself down. You've uh, let everyone down. It's a horrible yeah, feeling. It is um, and then another, another time only recently in Vicker Street I thought I got my period on stage do you know when you just feel this like flow and I I was and I'm wearing this pink red ju- pink jumpsuit and I was like oh my god I look like I've got stigmata now for the right time <laughs> and I was so paranoid and I couldn't concentrate at all and I went into autopilot again and I just looked like a lost deer in the headlights so they're oh. the they're the two that stick out for me oh man that was, I didn't enjoy at all through all my, it was all, all my own fault, but and it's all yeah. getting it's all getting wrapped up in your head as well. Particularly the Vicker Street one, where you're just like the audience is below me, they're yeah. looking up. This is physical comedy; they're going to be able to see everything. Oh God, yeah, like, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can hear it rattling in the background. Like I was like, do I leave? Do I check? Do I look down? Yeah, what do I do? Do what I stick do my do? hand down my pants? I know. Like, <laughs> I was like, what's the procedure here? I don't. What, what's the etiquette? <laughs> I was like, it's like the reverse of a gender reveal party. I was like, I've just, anyway, whatever. I was in the horrors. But anyway, look, we power on. You power on, exactly. And more power to you. I, so I've been checking out your Insta stories as well. Like they're popping up. Like I, I'm i living vicariously, because I'm, I'm at home with obviously two kids. So I'm living yeah. vicariously a lot through you, I'm going to I'm gonna say. Um, and on your, Thank you. And thank you, <laughs> by the way, for doing this. Uh, and I've noticed your Insta stories have now made red top articles in like oh and yeah and I'm like she's made it man she's so made I it so I was the ongoing <laughs> uh, my ongoing joke with Vogue is that like everything she does and says no matter how innocuous will end up as cl- a clickbaity kind of headline thing yeah if she Whereas, farts in the background oh yeah like that's it yeah exactly puts on a gassy display it'll be all over the place <laughs> whereas I was saying like I could do a lot of mushrooms and run naked down Grafton Street and no one would give a shit I'd just be like was Vogue there no one cares but um, but that has now. There's been a shift. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> now I was... like, but now I'm getting. It's so funny because all the every time they did it to Vogue, and we'd we'd not that we were reading them, but there'd be the usual. You know, who's this? How's this news? You know, blah blah blah. She's a disgrace. Let's Ireland down, <laughs> and we would laugh. And now it's the. It's like it's they're like spam bots. I get the exact same things under. Who's this? How is this news? How is she a comic? As funny as cancer, blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, I'm getting trolled now. It's so nice. Thank you. Oh, my God. Well, you know. A light troll. I mean, I don't. I light don't trolling. Care. But it's still trolling. It's still off, but it's still part and parcel as part of it. And it shouldn't be. And I hate even saying it because it feels like it justifies it because I don't think it's right at all. Like, just. But I think I've been watching it happen to people around me for so long that I. I, I maybe, maybe I'm a bit deluded, but I think I've got kind of a thick skin. I don't care because now look of course there's going to be times it will affect me of course because yeah. sometimes something will happen where people say I used to be such a fan but then you did this and that, and that kind of stings a bit but because mm. you feel like you've let them down but um, those those lads with the avatars were like you know uh, the footballer yeah. the footballer profile photo saying you're as funny as cancer couldn't I couldn't give a shit yeah 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 and that's they're pathetic they're, li- they're incels living in their mother's basement. I don't care. Do you know they're what I mean? They're nothing to me. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really healthy attitude, I think. To uh, And I think as well, a lot of comics, like you said, you have a thick skin. I think it has to go hand in hand with that. With the, it has to be part of the territory of being a comedian, I think. Totally. I know a comic who, I'm not going to say his name because I think he's actually using it for a bit part of a show or, or something, but he had, um, he was kind of struggling with people slagging him off online and he spoke to his therapist and they were saying there's things, this thing called exposure therapy where if you just expose yourself to it, you become desensitized to it. Wow. And that's what he did. He would just read them all and engage with them and pretend that he was someone else and that he agreed with them and all this. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is there is truth to that. If you, It's like anything. Yeah. The more exposed you are to something, the less the less impact it has on you, you know? 100%. That's really brave. Like there was mm. something somebody told me a while back and I thought this was a kind of a lovely thing as well. Like if you're getting a load of abuse hurled at you, it's nice to visualize yourself kind of stepping aside and just watching the abuse just roll past you. It yeah. really stayed with me. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So it's like even in a kind of an energetic sense, you just like, all right, stand aside, 
yeah. it roll, rolls past you and it's gone yeah. and you're like it wasn't really meant for me anyway it's not about me because yeah. inevitably it's not about you it's about them you know what I mean 100% if you can mm. disengage from it they're, they're, like they say hate's a mirror that basically they're just kind of throwing something at you that they feel about themselves or that they, you have something that they lack or and I remember going into one um, guy's account once because he was giving me a terrible time and his profile said I wish I'd amounted to more that's literally what his profile said and I was like if ever there was an amazing description of the character of someone who behaves like that online that is literally it and he and he's and he's being honest about it which is kind of nice that's heart on the sleeve stuff but also it's like okay bud if I'm a mirror for you and I'm triggering you you're going to have to start looking at yourself not you know what I mean yeah but I mean I don't know if there's any hope for them but (laughs) Um, there was something else I was going to say about it. It's not that it was, what was it? It was the hates and mirror thing always stuck with me. I like that. I can't remember. It'll, co- it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me because I do have some theories on it, which is actually quite helpful. Oh, this was it. There, it there's something, I'm in, a, I'm in a very lucky position in that I actually don't get that much. I don't get that much shit online. Mm. Um, but also, you know, I'm selling my tickets. I'm doing my shows. Um Whereas if so, if you do something wrong, and so I, what I'm saying is, yes, there's negative mm. attention, but there's a lot of positive attention, which is lovely, and that's what keeps me going and what what keeps me focused and in good form. But if all you're getting is negative attention, like if you do something deemed, I'm talking like kind of cancel culture stuff, and yeah. all you're getting is negative. I mean, that's hardcore. I, I'd yeah. be in an asylum. Yeah, I think that's hardcore. And you're right, because you're on a really positive track. Like you said, you're selling out your shows, your tour's going really well, you're in a great space in your life. So it's like, it's deflecting any of the negativity. You're like, it's grand. You know? Exactly. I don't, I don't agree with them. Yes. But it's when you start agreeing with them. Mm. Or listening deeply to them. Yes. Mm. And you're like, actually, yes, you're right. Oh, my God. Sorry. Oh, you <laughs> you're very welcome to the Live Well podcast, whoever you are. <laughs> My eyes, my Daisy. <laughs> Hi, Daisy. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, two seconds. Two seconds. Poor Daisy. What do you do? You have more than one housemate? Oh my God, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of in a in a in a holding pattern in a house at the moment. So I moved into this house in Clapham. There's five of us. I moved in three years ago. Now it's a big house, so it's mm. fine. Do you know what I mean? There's loads of space and stuff, and we're it's all everyone's kind of ships in the night, especially because I work nights and they work days mm. and that kind of thing. But now we were all here for lockdown, which was actually lovely. I mean, if I'd been on my own for lockdown, I think I would have lost it. But now it's time for me to. I've outgrown the house. Mm. The girls, all the girls that I moved in with, have all moved out and moved on. Ah. Uh. But because I'm in this kind of weird bubble at the moment with work that I'm not here that much and I'm, I'm a bit of a circus at the moment I'm travelling around all the time Yeah. that I can't really there's nothing like there's not, it's not worth moving out yeah because you're barely there I'm not there I'm not here enough but also I need somewhere to keep all my stuff yeah so I'm in a bit of a holding um, in a on hold at the moment I would say yeah, yeah and then yeah. hopefully I'll buy somewhere that's my plan just keep working away yeah. squirreling away and then try and buy a house yeah awesome and going back to like your school time and that I was reading an article and you said um that your comic chops kind of started in school like mm. did you well it was kind of like that you were chatty and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you also said that you were a prefect at one point and I was like probably was we were all prefects but I think what? you well, you were prefect I could never see you as a prefect sorry but I didn't yeah. mean that with respect oh, of course <laughs> um so I remember so I, I was definitely the class clown I know that a lot of comics um kind of maybe I when I hear them interviewed I don't know but they they the, they seem they say that they were quite serious in school or mm. they say they weren't the class clown or and they kind of developed their comedic side later mm. But they're probably smarter than me. Um, <laughs> but I was definitely the class clown, 100%. I was always looking for laughs. I was always looking for laughs. Cheap laughs. I was disruptive and I wanted attention and I was looking for laughs. And and I remember it very, like, clear as day. Joanna Joyce in primary school. I don't know, was I maybe like seven? And she just went, you should be a comic. And it stayed with me. And I never went in. Ne- and I never, ever, ever and like at seven or eight, we maybe were older. I forget what age we were in primary yeah. school. We were, we were babies. And it was one of, it's one of those memories I have 
from very young that I shouldn't really have. I don't know why it resonated with me, but yeah. it did. <sighs> and But I never did anything about it. But I do remember her saying that. So I was always trying to make people laugh. Yeah. That's that was, unreal. That I just thing. got goosebumps. Like to, to have that kind of resonate with you as a seven or eight year old. That, and yeah. Then, and then now like, you know, have it fulfilled is... I'll never forget it. Cool. Yeah. Like that's now, amazing. I, I thought I'd end up in acting or something like yourself. I thought yeah. I was going to go into the acting world. Um, I knew that I liked performing. There was definitely a show pony there. Um, and then my family, I mean, my mum's obviously very encouraging in many ways, but mm. when it came to the arts, she just didn't know anything about it. And she was like, that's not, that's not a job. That's a hobby. Yeah. You don't, that's not a, that's not a profession. That's something you do as a sideline. You know what I mean? On the weekends, you do your fates and your, you, you know what I mean? Your spoken word pieces and your, and your, you read your poems on stage, but you don't, it's not a job. So it wasn't encouraged. It was kind of, it wasn't really an option. So I ended up just going into like a regular job, but I knew I liked performing. I always mm. had that in me. What was your regular job? So I wanted to write. Yeah. Okay, good. And I was a good writer and I was I was a good speller. And because I'm adopted, I it, I it does it means something when you're because you you've no context for yourself really. So you don't know. Mm, interesting. You know, if you if you are biologically connected to the people, if you're around people whose DNA you share, yeah. then you probably share um abilities. So if someone, you know, if your father's good at maths, chances are you might be good at maths or whatever. And I probably um, fetishize that a bit that I just assumed that everyone's really like their parents because I didn't have that mm. um, but because I didn't have the context for myself anything I was good at I really leaned into it because wow. for identity I guess yeah. so so for example maths very bad to this day I, I you know what I don't think that's genetic I think it's a performer thing because I'm the same <laughs> yeah I'm but not. I think I think performing I think performing is I think it is there's a nature element to it I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily nurture I think yeah I, think I agree 50 50 50 nature nurture you're mm-hmm. you're neither one or the other you're both but um the performer side of me and the uh, English kind of writing spelling side that was nature I believe mm-hmm. so because I could spell and I was good at spelling um and I knew I was good at spelling because I was getting you know told and I was getting validation and that on that side of things I really leaned into it and wanted to write and then as I got older I kind of lost confidence in it because I am I mean writing it's a very tough gig and then I thought maybe journalism and they were saying journalism you'd kind of have to sell your granny for a story and yeah so I don't know I don't have any grannies <laughs> no resources I have nothing to sell so I ended up going I ended up going into public relations that was the that was how oh, I that ended was up your in real that. job okay that was my real job which is awesome because I presume that kind of set you up somewhat for when you wanted to launch your own career and having that a little kind, kind of behind the scenes stuff a little bit it was really helpful for understanding the relationship the, the relationship between this side of things and the media mm. and it was also really handy for uh, branding so yes brilliant uh, poster designs branding logos the importance of like fresh headshots every year all that stuff mm. was definitely I got I learned about that stuff from PR mm. and that's the stuff I actually really still enjoy all that side of things yeah and, and then well I have to say your posters are very eye-catching as well you know what I mean they, they read they put they pop yeah, Dwayne Dugan does my posters, but we, me and Dwayne have a great, because he knows what I like and he's very good at doing them. And um, so that's, the branding thing is huge. It's huge because, you know, even the, the decision, it's like a jumpsuit. That's a, like, it's a certain look and that it's, if you just, it's like an ad. If they just keep yep. seeing the same thing again and again and again. How many pink jumpsuits do you have or is it just the one? Not enough. I've run out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a costume you know it like is. I always think if someone has a certain if they have a look like there's certain certain comics that wear a suit on stage yes or certain comics with their um their their look is like a white t-shirt black jeans but they have a certain look so the second they you see them you know what you're getting yeah and yeah, that yeah. was what I wanted to do but um also I love I, I love a jumpsuit no more than yourself Hillary. we love we love a jumpsuit, we love a jumpsuit the tall we ones do. I it's funny because every time we meet up I always hug you and I go oh my god you're the same height as me I forget that you're tall as well you know what I mean yeah and I, I love that a lot and it's not that you give off small vibes you give off tall vibes but I just forget 
So yeah, every, yeah, yeah. I think I forget that I'm that size as well or something. It's a weird thing. And I hug you and I go, oh my God, she's the same size as me. This is We're huge. huge. We're huge. Were you, were you tall in school? I was a giant in school. Yeah. Yeah. I was the tallest in the class. Wow. Yeah. And I was really, I was quite self-conscious of my height when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting thing. Like my brother, my eldest brother is six foot five. He's a really big man. And when I had my son, I, I have really big children, like they're huge. They're just like really well built and they're going to be tall. Um, my dad said to me at the time, it's really interesting when you have small children be- that are tall because a lot more is expected of you as a child. Oh. Subconsciously, people that subconsciously think that you're older and they expect more from you. And wow. I kind of always felt that growing up, even though I was really tall above all my classmates that more was expected of me and there was more pressure put me but ironically I was like two years younger than everybody else so when everyone else was 18 doing their leaving cert I was 16 doing my leaving cert so I had this weird dichotomy of being actually really immature and really young but like being really tall and looking a lot older (laughs) and it's probably even on a very basic level it's probably because you're more visible do you know what I mean? You're yeah. more visible, so there's more expected of you because they can see you more. Yeah. You or catch the eye more. Why were you so young doing your leaving search? I, I'd say, I'd, I, my mum put me into school probably a year younger than she should have. I'd say she was just sick of me. She, the, I was the youngest. <laughs> I was. Like, That's I was, amazing. I was the fourth. I didn't, know that was, I didn't know that was an option. Oh yeah, back then it was. You can't do it now. It's illegal now. But like, um, I was the youngest of four and I'd say she was like, I'm fucking sick of this one now. Get her out. Because I was the surprise that came about five years later and she was like, ah, no, 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 no. Off to school. And then I was in the last of the, like I had the option to do fourth year. We were the last ones that had the option before it was brought in mandatory. So I was like, no fourth year. So by the time I got to leaving cert, I was 16. God, that's so young. So young. Yeah. I should be doing my leaving cert now and I'm 42. (laughs) (laughs) I I still don't know how I like, God, it's, you get so out of practice of, learning and mm. kind of regurgitating information and trying to maintain it all in your head and all that jazz and it, Jeez, I wouldn't like to be doing the leave in there I really really wouldn't no Ooh. and it is a practice I only really got into the practice of retaining information when I became an actor that's the only time yeah because I was forced to do it like I was awful in school I was such a daydreamer but like I was forced to do it as an actor that you have to retain huge huge parts you know yeah. bodies of information and it's great now it's like really opened up that side of my brain <laughs> that yeah, was asleep yeah, yeah. for so long and it's the same for you like I know it's your material so it's life experience but there is a set that you learn yeah but there's uh, I do think it's hard it's I would struggle learning lines with scripts that's something I'm not used to doing mine my my show is kind of a bit it's a bit loosey-goosey like obviously there's jokes there's jokes I have to hit and there's lines I have to hit but ultimately no one knows if I do or I don't it's kind of a, it's up to me really no one's gonna be like sorry you missed a line there let's go again it doesn't matter I can just roll on whereas lines like I even struggle like I've done very few but I've done a couple of auditions and even learning lines for that I find it very hard but it's interesting I used to find it really really hard like really difficult to retain big segments of information and I remember having a conversation with other actors and it was like, how do you learn your lines? What do you do? We were all comparing notes, you know. And one of them just turned around and said, I find it really easy to learn lines. I just learn them like that and they go in. And the second that person said that, it, it's like it flipped a switch in my brain. And instead of me turning around and saying, I, f- I find it really hard to learn lines and it takes ages and I have to do this, that, the other. It flipped the switch and I, j- I then started to say, I find it really easy to learn lines. It's no problem for me. They go in really quickly. And the second I said that, it started to work that way. There you go. Like that. I'm, all, all I, do, I, I, you're like um, when they say, you don't say, I've given up. So if someone says, say you're trying to give up smoking and someone says, you're coming in for a cigarette, you don't say, I'm trying to give up or I'm giving up. You say, I do not smoke. Yeah. It's the same and thing, that's, yeah. And that's the way I quit smoking. I used to smoke 20 a day for like, oh God, 10, 15 years. Like I was a real chronic smoker at one point. Yeah. And I just went, I this is this is a waste of my time and my life and my yeah. money i'm not smoking anymore and like that i just went i don't smoke anymore that was the best it. thing i ever did was stop smoking yeah it kind of is isn't it and it's very unlike me because i love a vice love a vice oh there's and plenty I'm... more you can pick up don't worry i know i know <laughs> i know i know and i'm just i'm so happy that i don't smoke. now don't get me wrong if i'm at a party 
and someone's out the back having a cigarette, I'll definitely wander out and be like, hey, what's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have a little puff. But I'm nothing like, nothing like I was. I, the chain, like, it was when I drank, I was never really a day smoker, but it was the second the cork popped out of that wine bottle, like 20 fags in my mouth in one go. Yeah. It was the association, drink, yep. drink in one hand, fag in the other, deep and meaningful chats, let's go. Yeah, big time, big Loved time. It. I, even now when I smell cigarette smoke, uh, or any kind of smoke I just get transported and I kind of go oh my god festivals summertime late night you know what I mean and I just I switch into that and I go no 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 no, that's okay you've done all that you've done yeah. it good oh it's all right to, to feel it but yeah I really have yeah. to, I've to I, I, I feel like actually as a former smoker I have to watch myself with cigarettes like I just I don't think you'd ever be safe that's that's my my take on it yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I would be with smoking now. It's something, to, just a the really big switch went off of me and I was like, nah, I'm done. Yeah, it's funny. And even the smell of it now, I can't stand the smell of it. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I can't. I, How long ago did you quit? A couple of years. It was a slow, it was a gradual process. I didn't wake up one day. It was, I gradually just went off them. Mm. It was like, you know when they say, if you're, you know, some people, their parents caught them and they made them smoke 60 in a row and they never wanted another cigarette again. <laughs> yeah. It was like that, except that never happened. I just, just, and they, they, they began to fall out of fashion. When I was growing up, it was cool. It became uncool. In fact, it was to the point where if you were smoking outside, it looked a bit pathetic. You were the one, you were on the balcony on your own having a cigarette. It was pathetic. I actually agree. It's funny when you see people outside pub smoking, you're like, you're still smoking. Really? Yeah. yeah. And it's that, weird. that was what, that was what, that was how it uh, kind of, I made sense of it in my head. I was like, this isn't cool. This isn't sexy. Mm. This isn't social anymore. No one's out here with me. This is just me on yeah. a balcony. Everyone else is warm inside feeling sorry for me because I'm a slave to this fag yeah 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 absolutely and it's like it's even now if you see like b a bunch of teenagers around town it's weird if you see even one of them smoking you don't see any of them smoking no they're because it's just it's over it's so over everything's done it's so. done done lads i'm it's glad done. i was part of it i'm glad i had that <laughs> <laughs> i'm hoping our lungs have kind of recalibrated now and they're all fresh and ready to go i think apparently within a year you're good to go again unless That's you start what they say uh, you know we'll see we'll see um Speaking of advice, a lot of your routine formerly used to be about your body and your body image and that. Yeah. Like, has that changed shape for you? Not your body, but as in like, has, has your image of it changed shape for you? Yeah, big time. Like the smoking, when I was a, a teenager, being thin was the only thing that mattered. That was, that was what was fashionable. Now it's being um. fit yeah. and healthy, yeah. which I'm sure has its own problems. I'm, yeah, I have yeah. no doubt there's people out, like there's young people out there doing steroids and all that shit to get this look that's in on vogue at the moment. Mm. But when I was, it, it was thin. Mm. You could not be thin enough. So that was kind of planted in my head as that was the goal. So then of course you mix it with whatever way my my brain works and I have issues around compulsion and issues mm. around, like I obviously had self-esteem issues and um I was quite unhappy and unfulfilled and all that jazz. So I was ripe for an eating disorder, I think really, mm. because I'm I'm quite competitive um i'm i want you know to succeed at things so weight was something i saw i could succeed at by basically having none of it wow on me so that's the psychology behind it yeah i think so and yeah. i suppose a control element in your life as well i always feel like i suppose as an outsider looking in i i always wondered is it a control element like control over your body control over your life big time well they say that's the one side of it that never really rang clear for me I'm sure it's part of it mm. but it wasn't like there was anything now I will say um I wasn't very happy in my job in my it did feel like there was a side of me I felt I could I was unfulfilled absolutely yeah, I get it so yeah. yeah and so I know that a lot of people something very traumatic will happen in their life so they focus on minimizing their body and there wasn't anything there was that wasn't any massive trauma going on mm. I just felt very unfulfilled very mm. lost didn't feel I knew myself didn't feel I knew what I wanted or what I was about um, but it just felt like there was something missing. There was a hole, as they say, there was yeah. a hole. And it was just, I was always trying to fill the hole. It was with men or with booze or with well, food and then purging the food or being thin or whatever it was. It was mm. just something not right. It was mm. just always something not right. Has that hole been filled, do you think? Has it changed for you? Like Totally. And I will say, like, I know it sounds wanky, but it was comedy. It was getting into this job. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, 
then suddenly I felt like I felt more like myself even though I didn't know what that feeling was I didn't know what it was I didn't know because I knew something was missing but I wasn't sure what it was and um yeah it just it started checking all those boxes how long ago did you really like how many years ago did you really say comedy in earnest this is it I'm cutting everything else and it's just comedy like how long from from that decision to the point where you're selling out everywhere how long did that take you so I did my first gig in 2017 that's not that long ago yeah so five years ago gee Joanne that's unbelievable five years now what I will say is I got very lucky there's, there's a lot of luck to do with it um, when I was started women were becoming very fashionable in comedy before that point I was there was a wave there was a change happening and my I so said the timing was quite good and also because because I'd had to leave my job because I was getting treatment for an eating disorder I, I could focus on this 100% I was out of there was a lot of change going on mm. I knew I wasn't going to go back to my old life um, and this was felt like this m- new opportunity at the same time it was such a huge it was such a wild pivot for me yeah. that if someone had at any stage gone you're shit at this it's not going to happen I would have believed them I think but they weren't saying that I was getting a lot of encouragement yeah. which was fantastic and I needed it to be honest because I wouldn't have hung around if I wasn't getting that and then there was no real like moment where some huge penny dropped but there was a slow realisation I could do that. I could, I could do this. Mm. I can do this. Mm. I'm going to do this. Oh, wow. I love it because I, I do remember a, like around that time seeing a few clips of you online and I thought, I was like, she's brilliant. She's got something. She's brilliant. And it was before I knew you actually. It wasn't at the start now, I remember. I was, no, it was. But I was, it I, was. what I had was, I was, de- I was determined, which I think is a huge part of it, to be honest. Yeah. Because you're always shit at the start. Everyone's shit at everything at the start. So you need, 100%. you need a, you need a healthy amount of delusion. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an actor. Healthy. A healthy, yeah, a exactly. healthy amount. Yeah. Not yeah. too much delusion. You need a healthy amount of delusion yeah. and self-belief. Yeah. Um, but you also need some, you need self-awareness. Yes. Um, and determination and opportunities and luck and so all of those things kind of came together you know like it was just a really it was meant to be really a good storm yeah 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 absolutely and you need the encouragement as well around you definitely like you mentioned before there has to be a little bit of yeah I always think it's like even if, if one person's got your back that one person can be can be a catalyst you know what I mean yeah yeah totally absolutely. and I had like good mentors around me um who kind of believed in me and were telling me I could do it like I have so much respect for comics who kind of come in against the grain or come in completely on their own I was I was kind of encouraged by another comic to start comedy so that's how I came in but there was people like loads of comics who just went in on their own they just went down and started doing open spots and kind of you know fought their way in you know and yeah. I have a lot of I have so much respect for them I had an easier route in, but once I was in, I made it work for myself, you know. You did. And you, like when you talk about all the perfect storm that was for you, like that, don't let that negate the amount of hard work that you put into it as well. Because yeah. without that, you wouldn't have had, like. Ah, uh, yeah. You, I did graft. Know. I grafted my ass <laughs> off. I really did. Yeah, yeah you did. I did. No one can take that from me, Hillary. No, no one. one can, no one can, no take one can fucking take that from you, Joanne. No Do you know what I mean? Like, with because, all the encouragement you had, no one can take it. What also is very handy is because I was. I'd no kids, I'd no responsibilities, I'd no mortgage. You know, I was free yes. to just do shit gigs for no money in Wigan. And you know what I mean? I was free to do those things. So there was a lot about my lifestyle at the time as well meant that I could kind of just put everything into the stand-up. That is part of the perfect storm. Really, really and truly yeah. is. Yeah, you're yeah. like, you're like, there's no one relying on you financially. You're not trying to pay no. out, you know, massive no. bills. You're just like, fuck it. I've got, you know, let's just go for it. Yeah, if I had children or if I had a husband or if I had a mortgage, I couldn't have done, I couldn't have put, I couldn't have committed to it the way I committed to it. Mm, amazing. So thank God for that. Thank God. Thank God. I had nothing else in my life of substance. <laughs> thank god i was totally on my own thank god thank god it was a really hard time in your life on a transformational yeah. process for all of us for all of us joanne thank god i had a pot to piss in thank god. <laughs> oh i love it do you feel like i uh, like some of your stand-up is or all of your stand-up do you feel like it's therapy or therapeutic no, I don't. Now, in fairness, the first show, the first stage show I did, well, the first stage show I was I was um, invited into was Singlehood. That's kind of how this whole thing started, mm. which was a show about, it was a mix of real people, i.e. 
you know, non actors and comics, and I was I was a real person. Mm. Um, that's I, the one was, I saw you. Suggest, that's the one that Singlehood. I saw. Yeah, and I went, oh my yeah. god, she's brilliant. She's got something. That was it. Oh, thanks, Hillary. There you go. So it was, I love the way we call real. So it was real people, and then actors and comics who were. <laughs> Obviously not real people. No, 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 They're no. They're freaks. No. Yeah. <laughs> so it was normal people and freaks um, talking about their love lives and kind of breaking up and getting back together. And, you know, it was kind of like a spectrum of kind of, you know, gay, straight, married, bi, whatever, mm. all talking about their experience. Mm. And um, so that's how it started. But the first stage show I did then off my own bat was, um, Bite Me which was mm. uh, directed by Una McCabe she, or she co-wrote she kind of dramaturged this kind of heap of writing that I'd done around the time when I was very unwell and that was kind of therapeutic I guess in the way mm. that it was performing that very dark time and, and kind of exercising it mostly yeah. that's how it felt so I guess that was therapeutic um, but since then, no, I don't think so. Now, don't get me wrong. It's absolutely lovely to say something that happened to you um, that you thought was very embarrassing or very humiliating or very funny. And then for women to say, yeah, 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 that happened to me too. Like, that's lovely. Yeah, it is brilliant. There is lovely. There's great There's great peace in that because you're like, Alice, we're all in this, we're all in it together kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, also, I would, I'd find it quite self-indulgent if I was going, this is therapy for me and I'm going to charge you 25 quid and <laughs> watch me... <laughs> have an epiphany of my own <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit rich now to be honest I'm like, that's a bit rude well I was gonna I was thinking that it's like you know I mean part of what you're talking about is like alchemy whether you know it or not it's an alchemy taking like something that is kind of a, a pain or part of darkness and transforming it into light and making people laugh yeah. And then making massive amounts of profit from it. Like, I mean, that's pure alchemy. <laughs> I'm, in a very, I'm in a very, I'm in a very nice position. But I do think that I've always had a pretty, they say comedy is tragedy plus time. And I've always had a pretty quick turnaround time on that. I have, I've always had a pretty quick turnaround time. I'm a very easy laugh. I'm laughing all the time, very loudly, um, much to the dismay of people around me on airplanes and stuff. So I've always been kind of lighthearted, mm. even with the bad stuff. Like Bite Me was ultimately... I mean, it was a dark, dark, but it was a comedy. It was a dark comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does bring light to that darkness. And I think like, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, I always feel with comedy, it gives us a little, a, a little segue or a little doorway into like things that maybe you feel that you can't laugh at. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, ge and, and, you know, when you're making people laugh at certain topics, it makes them relax. It makes, you know, their nervous system unwinds yeah. and you can kind of slip in. Not that, not that it's done in a, not that it's done in a nasty way, but you can kind of slip in topics like, guys, maybe we should look at this now. I, yeah. I think comedy does that beautifully. Do you ever do that intentionally or does it just happen for you sometimes? It just, I just... It just happens. I'm, I'm, I have very funny friends. Like some of the best laughs I've ever had, some of the best days I've ever had are at funerals because yeah. laughing relieves the tension. So when there's a lot of tension, that's what jokes do. Like that's what jokes kind of are. They're like, I mean, and now I'm not a joke writer as such. I'm not. I don't sit down and write jokes. I mean, I should, but I don't. So I don't, I'm not very good at like the exact structure of a joke. But from what I understand, a joke is basically you put tension in the room and then you release it with the punchline. Mm. That's kind of what it is. So, mm -hmm. of course, so it's when things are sad or tense or whatever, the great way to kind of release that tension is to make people laugh or to laugh or to laugh at someone else's joke or to say something stupid or... Absolutely. You know. I'm going to share something with you, right? So my dad passed away recently, okay? Oh, and sorry. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but he came from a very, very funny family and he was very funny himself. Uh, I shouldered myself and my two brothers and my three uncles shouldered my dad's coffin into okay. the church. Yeah. And he was, you met him. He was a really big man, really big man. So like we were all like, holy God. And, and like, you know, my brothers are big men. My uncles are big men. But this was a really heavy weight. And we were walking yeah. into the church and we were sobbing. And obviously it was so brutal. It's, so, you know, grief is so tough. And my uncle behind me just went... Jesus, he's a dead weight, isn't he? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and it was just in that moment where I was like, 
it's hilarious. Oh, it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It was brilliant. Oh, no. It Be- softens everything. And like, we need you know, it. And, and as well, you know yourself, you're like, my dad would have thought that was really funny exactly. as well. Exactly. You know what I mean? So he's actually in on the joke. He's in on the joke, literally. Yeah. I thought it was so brilliant. There was so many moments like that that were just so joyful during that period that comedy did that. Thankfully, yeah. comedy did that, you know? Yeah. Do you think there's anything like sacred, Joanne, that you wouldn't touch regarding comedy or topics? Um, yeah, there is. Like, I mean, there's certain things, especially now, like things have really changed. Like there's jokes that, I mean, I, and it's not exact. I'm not exactly, I'm not a massively edgy comic. You know what I mean? Um, Do you not but, think so? Um, I definitely poke at stuff. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a safe space comic. But I, yeah. de- I, but I definitely poke at things, but I don't really, I know where the line is. Now for some people, the line I have crossed, I do cross lines, but for, mo- for, the, for most people who come, they, they don't seem to care. Um, but particularly now with everything that's going on, you do second guess yourself mm. more. Mm. Because the thing about in, in at shows and in clubs and stuff is people don't have time to analyze a joke. They hear a word and they get tense and they, they make a really split decision mm. that no, 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 you can't, we're not going to laugh at that. Even though if they were to actually think about it or whatever way I think I've created this joke, it's not actually offensive. I've just used a word that you yes. associate with something that's gone on in the past, but it's actually not offensive. If you think about it, it's not. Yes. This is me, this is me justifying my material. But so you have to be kind of careful in that regard. So you might think, oh, that's so unfair. Like there's nothing in that joke. It's not bad. But the truth is in the room in that split second, they've gone, no, 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 you're not talking about such and such or you're not. Yes. Like for example, like I talk about um, being translucent as in I'm so white. I'm like, I'm practically a member of the trans community. Now, that, <laughs> like, there's nothing in that. <laughs> no, there's, there's nothing not. in it. It's that's just, just wordplay. Like. Exact, exactly. It's wordplay, but because you're bringing up the trans community because things are tense there at the moment and people don't want to feel like they're being um, yeah. anti-trans, that they, it, can, it can go either way in the room, but there's nothing really offensive in it, you know? Do you I don't th- think. I don't think so either, but do you feel then that maybe this kind of like social media and wokeism and this woke culture is really stifling the arts, not just comedy, but other arts? I think it's, I think there is, I think there's mm-hmm. an overcorrection which is what happens when, you know, it kind of, it's, it's like a pendulum, you know mm. what I mean? Um, and I think it'll come back around, maybe. But yeah, it, is, it can be stifling. It can be. Mm. It can be, especially for a certain type of comics who kind of get all, like their, their material is pushing boundaries and taking the piss and, you know, it can be. I don't know. Some people think, as comedians, they're kind of truth speakers and they're very, they're like Nostradamus and stuff. I don't really think I am. I just want to make people laugh. <laughs> but sometimes that is making people feel a bit tense. Sometimes that is making people laugh because you'll say something in the end to release, release that tension. So mm-hmm. I don't want people to feel like they're coming in for a warm hug. I want people to feel like they're going to be like, ooh. There are, I want there to be a couple of moments of, can she say that? Jesus, yeah, well, she did. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. On. <laughs> but I like as well, I mean, I think when you said you, you don't see yourself as an edgy comic, I do think you're an edgy comic, but I think the edge that you push to is always about yourself. 100%. Which is, this is why That's, it works really well and it's so relatable then. It's not like you're tearing apart anybody else. You're doing it to no. f- yourself, you know. The that, gag is always on me. And yeah. I think that's how you kind of know you're okay because you're like well no 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 that guy, that that guy was about i was the idiot in that joke exactly you were you yeah. were talking about yourself yeah exactly um i love your podcast with vogue thank you it's so brilliant it's just again more laughs the success of it like it went to number one on the itunes charts didn't it i'm not imagining that it did it's been there in in ireland yeah, didn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It floats around up there, yeah. It's amazing. Like, mm, did know, you? It's great. It really is. Like, and when you started it, I'm very proud of it. Good. I'm glad you're saying that. When you started it, was it a case of we're just going to do this for the laugh and see what happens, or was it like a strategic? No, it wasn't. It wasn't like um, uh, it was. There was stra- there was definitely strategy to it. Mm. I wanted to crack the UK. Uh, Vogue has a following in the UK. Mm. She wanted to do a different type of podcast. Brilliant. Felt, I felt like I could bring something to that. We're also really good friends. So we thought they would be a good pairing. 
and it did it worked um but no it was definitely like it was do you know what it was a very easy business decision because we knew we were going to enjoy doing it yeah and we felt we might both get something out of it which we have which is fantastic amazing it's called my therapist ghosted me did your therapist ghost you yeah <laughs> during lockdown <laughs> unbelievable I actually and i was so i i re it, finding a therapist i I had a, t- I had a tough time during lockdown as we all did mm-hmm. right but i did have a tough time and um i found this therapist who i absolutely loved now i was seeing him before lockdown mm. but i got i kind of really went into myself during lockdown a couple of things happened and i wasn't in a great headspace um and he just disappeared and i was so <laughs> devastated because he sorry was so for de- laughing i'm sorry no but it's it's hilarious like, who's you fucking care i didn't even know they could do that i was like are you not legally obliged to listen to my shit <laughs> come on um but he was so lovely but to this day i don't know whether he just gave up the have you never job have you never had any other sessions with him so recently because i was genuinely i was just so confused by it and recently i did message him again <laughs> He's like, will she ever get the fucking picture here? I know. Here? Like, but I just need closure. You- Sometimes you just need closure yeah. on something. And it's-, and it's hard when someone won't give you closure. They just they just won't give it to you and they just cut you off. And you're like, what? As a therapist, it's- he should know that. Come on. It's so difficult. It's such, it's it's not just rejection. It's just confusion and all that stuff as well. Oh, but um, yeah. it's so, I think it's so mean to cut someone off like that. I really do. Now, I don't know what this man's reasons were for it. He's, he was quite spiritual and stuff. So whatever they were, I... I respect them. I was probably being a lunatic. I don't know. But um, he said, uh, I said, do you still work in mental health? Because I hadn't, sp- yeah. I, he cut me off like, do you still work in mental health? And he went, Joanne, this is, uh, this is someone I would recommend for you to go and see and give me another therapist. No, no. <laughs> do you know when you're like, you're like, okay. arranged, am I? But, um, but I'm, actually in a, I'm actually in a great place now. But, but yeah, he did go to me. And it That's was only, we were chatting to Global um about the podcast and i just happened to say that in passing yeah and they're like that's perfect they're like that's the title it's brilliant it really is so like obviously you're and you're going to take it on tour as well so i mean Mm, this is another sellout again i'm gonna ask the question are you ever going to come off tour yeah i think so i think this time i'd say this will run it so um prosecco ends kind of the end i'm i'm i've a couple of i'm going kind of i'm doing um Dubai and going to do a show in New York and Vancouver and stuff wow. and then I'm in Australia for March and April for a month around that time and then once I come back from that that's Prosecco done and then the therapist goes to me podcast tour starts in London in May and then we'll I'd say we'll do that till the end of next year and then I don't know like I'm I've signed a book deal that I'm you know supposed <sighs> to be writing good for you there's other things that I'm supposed to be doing and um I'm kind of consumed by the tour at the moment so but, but yeah, I'd say I'll be going through straight. I'll go through until the end of 2023 and then we'll see. Wow. Well, I think as well, make hay while the sun shines, you know, make hay see, while the sun shines, baby. I, I, I love it. I genuinely, I, go. I love being on the road. Yeah. I've, I, I kind of, I like living out of a suitcase. It suits me. It suits you for now. Absolutely. Absolutely. For now. Yeah. It suits me for now. Yeah, exactly. Can we go to the Live Wild pop quiz? This is a quick fire yeah. round, okay? Go for it. Um, all right. What is your favorite gig and why? It can be your own or it can be somebody else's gig. Oh, um, I I love shows. I love musicals. Oh. <laughs> I love a good musical. And it's so nice um, living in London because you've got the West End. On yeah, the I do. So I went to see Tina Turner, the musical recently, which was amazing. Wow. I went to see Les Miserables again, which is amazing. Um, I went to see what else did I go and see there was a really good so I would say nothing in particular but I love but I love going in because I'm free during the day I'll go and see a matinee of like an amazing show what did I see recently with Chris O'Dowd was in it it was a play oh it was brilliant something about the stars let me google it let me actually google it because I want to know the name Go see saying, Phantom like of the idiot. Opera as well if you haven't seen it. Have you seen I'd Phantom? Love to see. I saw Brilliant. when I was a kid. But my mother brought me in to see it. I think in the Gaiety or the Olympia wow. or one of them. Chris O'Dowd stars. I'm gonna have to get it. I'm sorry. That's all right. Take your time. Ca- stars play London constellations. Oh, okay. 
was brilliant. Constantly. Anything like that. So like I love a matinee, a musical or a play. Love it. Favourite gig. What's your favourite bit or gag and why of your own? That changes all the time. Okay. At the moment it's about... Um, I like talking about... At the moment it's about mood rings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Because it's newer to me so I enjoy it. So, do you know what I mean? That's just... It, that's always like a time thing like I'm sick of that other thing and you find like as well like thing. the gag just like grows and grows and grows with each show or each performance like it adds kind of arms and legs to it a bit yeah and that's a lot to do with the audience if they're if they're in great form and they're laughing away it gives you space to add something else on to that bit mm. if they're not if it's kind of a quieter audience then you just kind of you don't really feel you can you just in roll case past it doesn't it. work yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome. but no, it's always, it's like a work in progress. It's always kind of a rolling work in progress. That's the way the show is really. Like it does change. Bits leap, bits come out, bits get taken out and bits get added in. Love it. Do you think laughter is the best medicine? Yes, I do. Yeah. It could really, it could, like I get messages from people. They're so nice just saying that something was going on in their life that wasn't great and that the podcast, do you know, just is a bit of a release. Um which is so nice to hear. So yeah, I absolutely do. I do. I really, really do. Mm. I think there's very, there's, it's a, it's for a moment. I mean, yeah. <laughs> do you know, it's not going to heal a tumor, but like <laughs> it might just give you a bit of relief in that moment that you can just laugh. Exactly. Look, yeah. you can't be hundred percent happy all the time. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. that's a fallacy, but like, it's not going to clear up a UTI, but <laughs> it will, it might just, might keep, of. might keep you company on the way to the clinic though <laughs> exactly exactly yeah <laughs> um what do you stand for joanne mcnally oh gosh yeah we're going there i don't I, I don't think i stand for anything as in i change my opinions on things all the time i like to think my jumping off point is a respectful irreverence <laughs> if that's if that's not completely it. contradicting itself i don't want to hurt anyone but i like to think i'm a bit irreverent and i'm not going to say i stand for justice and world peace in the environment it's too lofty for me but i i, st- I think i stand for having the crack the sacred rebel the sacred rebel there you are having the crack having the crack uh, yeah having the crack yeah you stand for having the crack there you go yeah uh, if you were to distill yourself down to an essence what would your essence be I would say CBD oil and gin. (laughs) (laughs) Is that is that an essence? That is a hundred. That is absolutely an essence. CBD oil and gin. So not salt. Oh to to chill. Oh to chill. Not your uh, saltpedine and uh, what was it? Bailey's. I saw you with once. Disgusting, but also delicious. We in our house at one point. Now this is more Peter than me. I'm going to hang him out to dry here. We had uh, what we called Nervino, which was Nurofen and wine. I this. Nurofen and red wine was Nervino. <laughs> I mean, that sounds amazing. Every now and again, I do get a message from someone saying that I'm gl- glorifying codeine addiction. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not. They think I'm on salpadine all the time. I'm not. I take it when I need to take it. Yeah. I just think it's. I just think. I just think salpadine's great crack. But like. I can't take it because it's got ca- it's got caffeine and I, I don't I don't drink coffee. I can't because I, I'd be f- not literally hospitalized, but I'd be I just I can't do caffeine at all. But that's because your body is so pure now because you've <laughs> literally you've purged every negative thing out of your body. So you can't handle anything now. Whereas I, I this is no word of a lie. I ha- injured my foot the other day and I went down and they had to clean it with alcohol wipes. And they're like, this is going to really hurt. It didn't feel a thing. <laughs> <laughs> didn't you, feel a thing your foot was already sterilized yeah. with the alcohol in your body so funny because i was kind of drunk and i stood in a wine glass or i stood in a gin glass or whatever and um Ooh. i know anyway Ooh. i saw the pictures it looks full on i love that there's no holes barred it's like yeah look what i just did i know <laughs> I, I, I do i'm i am missing um a filter I'm definitely missing that. I love it. I love it. Um, do you believe in magic? I mean, what kind of magic are we talking here? I'm not talking about like a rabbit out of a hat on stage. Yeah. Not that. I'm talking about like, do you think there's something greater outside of what you can see? No, I don't. I'm, I'd be quite sciencey. I don't mm. really. Like, I, 
I, I'd i love if there was I'd love to believe in it But no I mean I even find star signs A bit ridiculous <laughs> So no I'm so into it You'd be bored I know, I know. I'd l- I, But I'd love to be into it But I'm just not I know I know You'd be you'd be like you, I'd say if you were with me For like You know off air For more than an hour You'd be rolling your eyes Going I gotta get out of here <laughs> But I would lo- I would love to be more into it I'd love to go and do A load of ayahuasca I, I mean we've We've yeah. spoken about this I spoke mm. about this before They're like ayahuasca it, You you're better off just going to loads of like meditation classes than going to do an ayahuasca. It's a bit of a quick fix, but do you know what? It's not though. That's the thing. It just opens a doorway for you. Like it's um, and I, I you know, when I talk about this stuff, I don't think it's necessarily for everybody. But I think if it's calling you, then it's kind of calling you for a reason. And I think you'd be really careful with the people that you do it with, and all that you know, really have to do your research. And you know, like I hands up would a hundred percent say that. Um, but like, yeah, a, a quick fix. I, it's not going to fix you yeah you know but it will make you look at things like, differently yeah and you have to do the work the, yourself yeah that's the kind of magic i believe in mm. like i do think there are other areas of my brain that i don't use that well yeah. or that i could kind of kind of see things in a different light that's the magic i believe in 100 percent. well it's interesting because like a long long time ago science and mysticism and magic were all one thing they were all one thing but really? like yeah over hundreds and hundreds of years they got split into different factions so yeah they've gone their separate ways they've now. gone their separate ways but you know it might come back around you never know yeah you never know yeah. what is the wildest thing you've ever done probably going into stand-up like as in if you think about it it was such a weird it was such a weird move that mm. it was kind of a strange thing um i mean i have done other wild stuff but i wouldn't you know i know yeah exactly yeah. I know. We keep we keep we keep some things to ourselves. We will. <laughs> we'll save that for a glass of wine someday. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like beep 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 beep. I'd be in the other room going, no way. Yeah. <laughs> <gasps> How are you not in prison? <laughs> he was what age? <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're on a register now. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. What is the one thing that you do, seeing as it is the Live Wild podcast, I have to ask this question. What's the one thing you do every day that helps you live wild and free? Well, during, so during lockdown, mm-hmm. I, uh, like I say, was in a in a bad way. It, I just developed this anxiety. It was just anxiety. It was anxiety. But it was, you know, it was all day, every day, this constant I have this weird, I don't know, what, what is it when you're, I, so I'm a very jumpy person, like mm. something happened to me a couple of years ago, I don't know what it was, and I think I'm in constant, fight or flight, so I think it's flight, what's, uh, is it fight or flight, like, say the it, doorbell rings and I jump out of my shoes, yeah. I go to answer the door, there's someone there, I get a fright, I'm, I I have an overactive nervous system, yes. allegedly, yes, 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 so I don't know whether that's flight or fright mode, flight it's, or it's fight, it's the same, same thing, same thing, okay, yeah, my, mm. I, I'm a, I'm highly strong in that regard. Mm. So during lockdown, then mixed with some other things, I just just wasn't well. So during that time, what I would do is I would get up in the morning. I started like burning things like sage, yeah. and I would take CBD oil, and I would play the Bridgerton soundtrack, and I would breathe, and that was something I did to kind of would you say ground yourself yeah and it's calm a... myself it yeah. was something i did to calm myself i would mm. light incense mm. and i would play the kind of uh, the you know plinky plonky music yeah and <laughs> plinky all plonky that music. Stuff. the plinky plonky and that was something i did which i haven't kept up because i'm in a much better place now mm. but they're always they're always tools that you can always lean back on whenever you want and like that's what you'd had was a ritual so rituals make us feel safe exactly that's, yeah exactly it was that's exactly what it was it was a ritual it was a lovely ritual that mm. i did and i wouldn't be on my i wouldn't be online i would stay off my phone mm. and i would read affirmations yeah and all that jazz and i would i did some rapid tapping yeah there was a lot of rapid tapping going on and would kind of center myself mm. yeah i wouldn't be i'm not great with self-care to be honest <laughs> i kind of just go and go and go and go and then I feel like I'm going to burn out and then I might like have a bit of a cry and take to the bed and then I'm up again the next day and I go and go and go and go. I'm not great with taking the time 
you know? yeah i've i now i learned that i have to take the time for myself yeah i have to otherwise if i get burnout the burnout isn't like it won't go away in 24 hours after like a bowl of pasta and some sleep yeah it will go on for weeks if i don't manage myself yeah you know? of course and that's actual burnout i haven't mm. had actual burnout yet i just get to a point where i feel very sorry for myself and i get <laughs> angry with all my agents that no one told me i shouldn't do all this all these gigs and i feel i kind of have a bit of a i have a bit of a tantrum on my like do you know what i mean i just have a bit of a tantrum yeah i get it and then i just get back and then i just get back to it but um but no but there is some there's so much to be said for taking that time and i don't do it i just don't and it's a shame because it'll come then to the point where there is a risk of just burning yourself out because you just it's like that thing i have it in my brain because i work for myself if you're not doing something work related you yeah. feel like you're skiving off yeah i get it i get it and that's not the case like there has to be i think that's the work-life balance that i've had to come to and i've been forced to it because i've got kids so i have yeah. to do it like whereas i would have just go 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 all the time you know um so i'm forced to take that no i have to manage my energy i have to take a time out because it's not just for me now it's for the kids of course if they're yeah. suffering then you know the yeah. whole thing is in a spin so yeah i've yeah. never managed to meditate i've just never managed to be able to do it i can't it's it's i find it hard to kind of switch the switch the brain off the it's just a skill chatter. i don't have yeah yeah no i get it i'm the same i'm on the, i i practice different forms of meditation sometimes it's dance meditation because i'm just like i oh, fucking my body has to move and i just can't yeah. sit down and like the chit chat goes on and on and i'm like oh fuck it's pointless you know so but i think it's an awareness that just makes it yeah you're like better. i'm aware that i'm gonna lose my mind yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm aware i'll burn out that's okay that's cool yeah, that's fine. do you know what i do you know what I do love? And actually, after this conversation, I'm going to go online and buy one. Do you know those um, meditation bells, the sounds that you yes. play with the marshmallow, the stick with the marshmallow on the end? Yes. Sound therapy. I think I get a lot out of that. Oh, it's unreal. I just bought one for my friend. It was a heart chakra crystal bowl and played it for me. And I was just like, whoa, the resonation is just, it's super cool. A yeah. heart chakra. Oh, my God. A heart that's, chakra that's, crystal bowl. That's bowl. that's that's self care on acid. That's a lot of self care. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I need. I'm writing that down. A heart chakra crystal bell. Oh man, you you blow the you blow the roof off your house. It's awesome. Amazing. I've written it down. Okay. There you go. Joanne McNally, it has been awesome. I could talk to you for five more hours. But so nice to chat to you. Oh, it's great. So nice to chat to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Look at you. I love your Zen background and all. I'm very jealous. Look at the state of mine. Do you know? With a Tesco bag <laughs> and an IKEA lamp. I need to get out of this place. I've got, I've got, yeah, I've got my Buddha on the one side, my peace lily on the other side. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, like, is this backwards for you? What does it say? It says, "She who dives the deepest finds the greatest treasure." Ooh, love it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sounds like it should be around the back of a matchbox. It's one of those things. You're like, what does that actually mean, though? It's going into my book. It's going into my book. I, I had to put it up there because it's one of the chapters. So I was like, right, it's going into my book. What's the book about? Uh, it's kind of li like the Live Well podcast. It's just about kind of my waking up. I know that oh. sounds that sounds wanky, and really? I know that's that. amazing. Yeah. So it's it's and all and it's all the tools that I've leaned on over the last two to three years like breath work meditation all the different stuff and explored all different parts of myself and then kind of stuck it into a book Ooh. yeah that'll be very I, I will really look forward to reading that thank you whenever it gets released i don't even have does anybody want to sign it anyone because i don't how, know how far down the road are you have you started writing it yeah i'm very close to the end of the first draft very close <gasps> oh my god i'm so jealous mm, yeah so uh that's yeah amazing. yeah we'll see we'll see when and where when and where it happens that'll happen i've no doubt i hope so it would be nice joanne thank you thank you so much love you to chat to you